Our fourth speaker is Dwayne Wilson. Uh, Dwayne is with the Washington State DOT. He's the Bridge Asset Management Engineer. Uh, his duties include supervision of the Asset Management Unit, which is tasked with identifying and prioritizing preservation needs for 3,239 state-owned bridges. He's been with Washington for 31 years. He's done bridge inspections, and he's managed the Departments for Bridge Deck Rehabilitation Program. He's the primary author of Washington DOT's annual bridge asset management report, The Gray Notebook. I, I hope everybody's seen The Gray Notebook. That is a great reference for what's happening to assets in Washington State of all type, multiple classes. It's terrific. I look at it every time it comes out, every quarter. So what I'm going to do is kind of switch gears here a little bit. We're going to talk about composites in bridges. So what, what I did last year is I got an invitation to participate in the scan tour, and at work, my next door neighbor is Bijan Kalegi. He chairs and participates in a lot of NCHRP committees, and he said, hey, there's a scan tour going on on FRP. Would you like to join? I go, okay, what's, what's that all about? And he goes, well, you just go out and look at stuff from other states, and then you do a report back. And so that's kind of how I got into this. At the time, I really didn't even know what FRP was. We had done some of it in Washington State, but I didn't know the breadth and the scope of it. So here's a kind of a good definition that I found from one of our participants in the scan tour. Uh, FRP is a composite material made of polymer, epoxy, vinyl ester, polyester, matrix reinforced with fibers, carbon e-glass, and then the other ones. So basically, you have these fibers in the polymer mixes, and then they can be designed different ways for different applications. Um, so that's kind of a broad, general sense. So what we did is uh, NCHRP puts together scans. They get ideas for scan subjects, and um, the FRP use for um, transportation structures was selected, and then we went out last year. Um, so they, they have been working on the report now that the scan is done. It should be done here in August. I've looked at the draft, and it looks like a really good report. So if you go up to the website, you kind of see this uh, here, and just the, the little caption I wanted to, to uh, just say here is the purpose of this scan is to inform the transportation industry on successful applications of FRP within DOTs as well as techniques that may be appropriate, adaptable for use. So the scan. Um, we did it in two weeks. Um, first week of June last year, we went out to uh, Maine and Florida. What this map shows you is the orange-green is where we kind of went, but that's all. We, and then there's also a person from that state that was a participant. And then the green is a participant. And then the blue was states where the FRP scan would ask the state to come in wherever the scan tour ended up and give presentations on different topics. So there's quite a cross section uh, represented here. This was the, the people on the scan tour. One of the things, when I looked at this photograph, I thought, hmm, that's kind of interesting. Everybody from the south is not wearing a tie. Everybody from the north is wearing a tie. I don't know if that means anything, but it just kind of came out in this photograph. Um, so on the, on the bottom left, um, you have Jerry O'Connor, who's from the University of Buffalo. He was the subject matter expert and also writes the report. Uh, they do a lot of classes there at University of Buffalo on composites. And so it was just a really great cross-section. The other thing I liked about it was there was great accents on this team. I mean, you had Wayne Frank Frankhauser from Maine. I don't know if you've ever heard somebody from Maine with that great accent that they have. But uh, some of the people from the South had great accents. You know, and then you have me, just kind of like a boring Washington State you know, no, you know, accent at all. So anyway, <laughs> here's where we visited different sites. Uh, when we went to Maine, we went to Harbor Tech and Kenway, uh, AIT Bridge Systems, 
and then the Maine DOT, University of Maine, Florida DOT, University of Florida, Michigan DOT, Lawrence Tech, and then Oregon and Washington. So kind of a brief overview, mature applications of FRP for new construction, they have what they call hybrid structures, composite arch, and then a composite beam, and I'll show you some pictures and explain that a little bit more. Reinforcement in concrete, GFR, glass fiber reinforcing, carbon fiber reinforcing, uh, pre-stressing strands, post-tensioning, um, marine fenders and piles, drain pipes and scuppers. For existing bridges, the repair of concrete, uh, either due to collision or deterioration, concrete strengthening, and then seismic retrofit. So let's start with Maine. That's the first place we visited. The Maine DOT has leveraged the experience of the state's composite boat builders and partnered with university researchers to develop new infrastructure applications. So here's kind of a synopsis of uh, concrete-filled FRP arch nine structures, uh, composite beams four structures, GFR rebar three, composite bridge drains 10, the post tensioning fender piles, load bearing piles. That's one of the things that they've, they're kind of on the forefront, and I'll talk about this a little bit, but um, they still have steel pipe piles filled with concrete in kind of like ocean applications. What they're trying to do is see if uh, fiberglass filled with concrete will do the same thing. So they gotta answer some questions about driving those fiberglass piles in rocky conditions. So they did some research trials to check that out. So hybrid composite beams, HCB. So what it is is this fiberglass box that they fill in with foam and then they put a concrete arch inside the box. They use pre-stressing strand on the bottom, comes up the top, that kind of acts like the tie of the arch. And then they have other reinforcing there and then they top it all off with the fiberglass top. So you can see some pictures there of uh, one of the beams being constructed and then one of the beams kind of uh, almost done. So when, anytime you want to try a new product, you need to stand behind or stand underneath your product. In this case, the designer of the, that, um, he took his product up to Canada, they built a span uh, on a railroad, and then they load tested it with the train. Uh, here's an example. One of the pluses of these types of beams is they're really light. Uh, so far, they've only gotten up to about 60, 70 foot spans. So, you know, that's one of the advantages is you don't need as big equipment out in the field to move them around and put them in place. Here's a um, bridge that we visited. And I just, you know, I just really appreciate the names up in Maine. Knickerbocker Bridge in Booth Bay, Maine. I mean, those are just great names. Um, so they have this a lot of inlets that come in from the Atlantic Ocean, and so they need something that's resistant to corrosion. Uh, so they put these hybrid beams up. Uh, still, the, you know, the weak link of this bridge is the steel pipe piles. So they're trying to get to the point of maybe getting a composite type pile that won't deteriorate or corrode in ocean environments. And then they got Brave. And all the bridges up till now were over waterways or different things. Now they introduced a bridge over a highway. And we know what happens, you know, when you go over a highway, it just seems like people forget how tall their loads are and they hit your bridge and then what are you gonna do about it? So there was actually some research done where they built this setup, they built a beam and then they built a rail with a load on it and they rammed against the beam just to see what it would do. Um, and so then they could come up with different techniques for repairing those beams. So this is kind of old versus new, you know, Fred Flintstone versus the Jetsons. As far as, uh, you know, here's the new technology that's, that's coming around the corner. And then as far as projects with these types of beams, it's kind of spread from the East Coast, started up in Maine, and it's kind of coming over towards the West. So the next type of structure is this composite arch. So what they did is they took um, com 
uh, carbon fiber tubes, and then they would fill them full of self-consolidating concrete. You get that by putting the tube in, cutting the hole in the top of the tube, and then filling it with carbon fiber, I mean, for with um, SCC concrete. And then you get this kind of this culvert type arch structure. It requires a fairly hefty footing. Um, so that's, you know, that's one thing that it needs to be done. But it does have ability to be on a skew and it has different heights that you can um, have it done. So here's an installation picture. Uh, another, you know, another plus, even though it shows a big crane here, another plus is you could use smaller equipment to um, install this. So once the tubes are in place, then they put this uh, fiberglass decking on it that will contain the earth. And then here's an example of a, a really good application, really, if you have some type of trail or something like that. Um, this arch was done on a skew, and uh, it's pretty, pretty high pitch. So Florida. Florida DOT has performed a variety of research and performed multiple FRP applications that focus on concrete repair of bridges. Um, so they're, they're really heavily involved in repairing pre-stress girders and other things. Um, they do things different than we would do in Washington State. If somebody hits our bridge, we want it put back to new condition. They're more concerned about that bridge being out of service. So they will go repair a damaged bridge instead of just going and replacing the whole pre-stress girder. Um, the other thing that I'm kind of envious of Florida is they have a really good testing laboratory as part of their DOT. So they can take full-scale pre-stress girders off of bridges and go do load testing on them and see how those FRP repairs have held up over time. They have a lot of connections with research uh, universities. So they're looking into questions like what's the life cycle of these um, products and where they can be used and you know some of the questions has come up long term. So here's a kind of a typical um, picture. They have their maintenance crews now that are fully um, able to repair girders. And then here's just an in-service girder with a repair to it. And then here's one of the girders that they had in their yard um, waiting for testing. So they did this you know, repair on this girder, and maybe they did it 15, 20 years ago. Now they can pull it into the testing and actually um, run some numbers to it. So an example of a, um, a project that they have coming up is this Halls River, River Bridge, kind of in the central western part of Florida. Uh, what they want to do is use all composites in this bridge. Uh, so they're going to use the hybrid composite beam, they're going to use the GFR bars, and then they're going to use the carbon fiber strand. So the plan is to start from the bottom using pre-stressed concrete piles. They'll use the carbon fiber strands. They've had a lot of issues and problems with other coated bars, like epoxy coating. Um, and then the colors didn't match up here, but the yellow, they're going to, in the caps, in the deck, in the rail, they're going to use all glass um, GFR rebar, and then they'll use those composite, um, hybrid composite beams. So they, the last time I looked, they were supposed to get the bids opened uh, this next month. And then they had, in their presentation, they had kind of a breakdown of the different of costs, and they showed like a conventional concrete bridge at $166 a square foot, and then this proposed hybrid would be a 282. So the cost differential would come out is if this composite lasts longer and you get longer service life, the, lower, the life cycle would be lower. And this is just kind of an example of, there's uh, quite a few states out there that have tried um, the glass fiber reinforcing index. Um, so what they also have done in Florida is these um, fiberglass pipe piles. And so they have to come out in one piece. You can't splice them or anything. So whatever depth you need, you kind of have to kind of have it trucked out. But they're pretty light before you fill them up with concrete. So look, 
you got this truck here, it doesn't even have a lot of axles on it, uh, carrying this whole supply of fiberglass pipes. And then here's kind of a picture of them in service, uh, installed. This is a really good application for them. And then another picture. And so the, the hope is that these fiberglass pipe piles filled with concrete will last a lot longer than um, other options. Michigan, uh, Michigan has had a lot of um, innovation and a lot of encouragement to go with um, different types of composites. And one of their biggest ones is on the post-tensioning and the pre-stressing strands. They've done a lot of research on that. So they've done uh, column wraps and strengthening. So we visited Lawrence Tech. And at Lawrence Tech, uh, their professor was showing us a variety of things that they're testing and looking into. It's nice to have some research done before you actually put it out in the field. Uh, they were showing us for pre-stressed girders, uh, just the different reinforcing that they were doing with uh, carbon fiber. And this was kind of a picture on their wall, but they would take a typical pre-stressed girder bulb T and then all the reinforcing within that beam is carbon fiber, including the strands. So this is kind of the forefront as far as something that could resist corrosion. The other thing that they kind of have to ask is, okay, what happens if you fill up this pre-stressed girder with all of this carbon fiber? What happens if a big fire happens? A truck with a tanker truck is underneath your bridge and a fire happens. Well, they built this big oven and within that oven they have the capacity to put in a beam and then load test that beam while it's being cooked or fried. Um, so it's kind of interesting. Uh, this was kind of a close-up picture of that. Um, so they got a lot of research going on on that and then they can relate back to say, okay, this is what your load capacity would be um, after a certain level of fire. And then we uh, visited a bridge out in the field this Rogue River Bridge. One of the things you'll see on this picture is those big tubes on the side there is transverse post-tensioning. With the carbon fiber, you don't need to grout it. So the sense is if something happened and you need to replace that post-tensioning, you could. Uh, so it has the ability to do that. That's kind of like that thought of designing for future maintenance. Then underneath the bridge, they have carbon fiber rods that they use for their pre-stressing, and then on the di diaphragms there, they have stainless steel, and then they have little um, sleeves for the, the rod to fit in. So we came back out west, and then Oregon, as far as a synopsis of um, what they've done. A lot of strengthening on their bridges. They've done some um, GFR rebar and um, FRP decks. So one of the examples is uh, we went east on Interstate 84 out by the Dalles, looked at a bridge, a Rock Creek Bridge, which is a couple of uh, concrete T-beams. And Oregon kind of did it differently. When they built these T-beams, sometimes they would terminate the, the shear reinforcements at different locations. And so now with the heavier loads and things that we have, um, it was determined that these bridges need to be strengthened. So what you're seeing is that gray color is the carbon fiber wrap of the concrete T-beams. One thing that's interesting when we went out there and we were talking to their folks, okay, now you have these um, composite products out there, how do you inspect them? What should you be looking for? It's a kind of a whole new ball game. We're kind of used to timber, steel, and concrete and what those look like. Now you got to look at composites and you know, looking for debonding. Or is it still well bonded? Well, they had a little tool there that they just put these little motorcycle sprockets on and they could kind of run it across there and it was kind of like a, a chain drag or a delamination test. You could hear whether that carbon fiber was well bonded still. So those are the kind of things, things about long-term wise, the inspection of these composites. So in Portland, they have a unique situation going on. Uh, a long time ago, 
Multnomah County, Multnomah County took over the ownership of five bridges in downtown Portland. Uh, so one of those is called the Broadway Bridge. They're really cool bridges, very unique. Uh, you could actually do a water tour on the Willamette to, to see those. But on this particular bridge, it was an older bridge. It had a steel grid deck. And Multnomah Co County thought, OK, it would be great if we could put a composite deck and, and replace this steel deck. So we went out on the scan tour, and they were able to give us um, they took a lane, and we were able to get out there and look at it. This one had an original composite deck installed in 2004. And then the trolley, the electric train came along, and they needed to replace another section of it in 2010. Um, and this is just a close up. You know, one thing about the composite decks is you need a polymer overlay on top of it, um, and that will require maintenance over time. Another bridge called the Morrison Bridge. And what happened there is they installed an FRP deck in 2012. And it was kind of a modular system where you had these beams and then these panels went on top of it. In their yard, they kind of showed this little scale model of what we're talking about. They built these kind of like these eye shapes out of a composite material. And then you'd have this deck on top that you would um, connect down. Um, the only problem is that some of those connections weren't holding up very well. And so they showed us kind of the bad side of this type of decking, is they were having to do a lot of maintenance after just a few years, where they were having to reconnect those panels down. Um, so that's, that's not too good. So in our state, um, we've done some seismic retrofit with uh, carbon fiber. Um, the, the strengthening, pontoon repair, and then the rebar was mainly in our tunneling operations. And then one composite bridge deck was not actually a state bridge, it was a county bridge. And that bridge has uh, since been re replaced. But here's a cutaway version of what uh, the tunnel machine Bertha if you're curious about what the word, you know, naming convention is, well, all the tunnel boring machine get names. They're female names. They had a competition. And the competition, there was a female named Bertha in the 20s that was the mayor of Seattle. So they decided, OK, let's name the tunnel boring machine after Bertha. So here's a cutaway version. We had some issues and problems with Bertha at the beginning. They had to build some safe havens for Bertha. And each one of those safe havens, they used glass rebar for the tunneling machine to go through. So that's kind of our experience with the glass rebar. And then here's just another picture of the tunnel boring machine coming through this, what they call safe haven. They pop it through here, and then they're able to take the, the thing apart and rebuild it. So we got the world's longest floating bridge. Um, just opened up in April, had a big party. One of the issues we had when the first round of pontoons were being built is there was some excess cracking in the pontoons. So we had um, four pontoons that needed to have some repairs done on it. Uh, one pontoon was sent down to Portland for dry dock. One was in Seattle. And then a couple others, we did uh, a dry dock on the lake with the cofferdam. So here's one of the um, pontoons on the lake. And then here's one of the pontoons in the dry dock. So in the, the end sections of the pontoons, all the cracks were filled, uh, sealed up. And then um, carbon fiber was used. It, you know, when the, the engineer was talking about it, we didn't really need the strength of the carbon fiber. They could have used fiberglass. But a decision was that uh, extra strength couldn't hurt us. So they put in the carbon fiber on the pontoons. Um, one of the things that we're now learning is that this will be a great laboratory test because there's not a lot of examples of carbon fiber completely inundated in water. So over the life, what's that going to do? We'll find out. 
So here's a big bridge, kind of parallels I-5 in Seattle. It's the SR-99 Aurora Avenue Bridge, built in the 30s. It now has over 58,000 uh, ADT. I don't know if you were up on the news a while back, but we had a amphibious vehicle crash on this bridge. It was called the Duck. So it's currently listed in the National Registry of Historic Places. I like this photograph because uh, this um, boat, this major boat with a tall mast, just made it out before the, the bridge was completed. Another picture of the, of the bridge. It's a you know, really nice historic bridge, combination of, of steel and then concrete approaches. But the other thing that's very unique about it is it's got these kind of plus signed um, piers. And so when we got into um, discussions on the retrofit of this bridge, uh, historically, we wanted to keep the shape of that plus sign. We didn't want to put on big steel, you know, um, retrofit that kind of looked like RoboCop or something. We wanted to match the existing look of the bridge. Um, so multiple approach spans. Uh, here's another view of what those are. They vary in length and height. So aesthetics, we wanted the look of the columns to remain the same, but we had another unique feature is some of them have these split columns for, uh, to handle, ha handle thermal movements. So what do we do? Um, first of all, we had to answer a lot of questions. We decided to do some research. So we um, partnered with uh, Washington State University, and the goal was to find out if the FRP wrap would survive the earthquake, provide us enough um, resistance in um, these different situations. We also had the unique detail of interior corners. How do you anchor the carbon fiber wraps on those interior corners? There was some discussion of using kind of like angle iron and bolts, and we finally settled in on drilling holes, putting carbon fiber in there, and splaying those carbon fibers out and then tying that into the carbon fiber wrap. So here's the construction. This was kind of a third phase. Uh, the construction phase, about seven and a half million dollars. Um, you can see in this picture, they're doing carbon fiber wraps. We're doing collars on the top and bottom of each column. And then you can kind of see in the picture, not too great, but on the beams, we were kind of reinforcing the beams, the side of the beams. So here's a picture of the uh, carbon fiber wrap in process. One of the things I learned on the scan tour is that you don't get, you know, like double the strength if you put two layers on. Um, generally, they're saying don't exceed two layers because as you go up in layers, your additional benefit actually doesn't increase that much. Uh, another picture. One of the things we, we wanted the carbon fiber on there and then we had to look, we need the look of the gray old columns. So there was some trial and error there about putting some different mortar and painting over the top. And then what's a bridge without a troll? Uh, if you know the Aurora Avenue Bridge, it's kind of a unique hidden, you know, like see the backside of Seattle or underground Seattle. The college, local college kind of built a little troll there that's holding a Volkswagen bug. Uh, so it's just kind of one of those um, things you, if, you have, if you've seen everything else in Washington, you want to go see this. So obstacles to the use of FRP, the lack of astro guide specs. So that's one of the things that needs to come along is to give designers the tools to you know, apply the formulas and, and design with these FRP um, materials. Uh, we need to share more information between what we do. Sometimes states do it in a vacuum or, um, and um, then don't share that information. So proprietary nature of some of the products. And sometimes, you know, you, you have to kind of try sometimes and sometimes you might fail, but um, you, know, you can't let that totally derail you from doing some things. You kind of learn from your mistakes and move on, but sometimes those you don't get a second chance to make a first impression. And so sometimes people get that word out that, hey, this stuff just doesn't work. 
So consider FRP when a truck hits a bridge, strengthening is needed, design deficiencies for a concrete member, corrosion resistance, pre-stressing strands in harsh environmental conditions, lightweight superstructures or seismic retrofits. And that's it. I've got a couple, they all come back to inspection. You, know, you mentioned that there's the sounding device. Um, so now your state has got some CFRP underwater. It's got some CFRP on this um, historical bridge, which is at least easier to get at. How are you inspecting? Or how do you anticipate to inspect them? Uh, that's a really good question. Because, um, you know, on the lake, it's going to, the pontoons are going to get kind of surrounded with junk and stuff. We do have divers that will go down and look at it. But um, we have not really, you know, kind of determined what techniques or how we're going to do it other than visual. For a pontoon bridge, I'm, just, this, I'm blank on this, okay? So, so this, is a, <laughs> this is a stupid question. Is a pontoon a superstructure or a substructure? Uh, we would consider a substructure. So it's a five-year cycle for inspecting it? Uh, no. We, well, yes and no. I mean, we do have dive teams that go under there, and then we have a routine cycle for the anchor cables themselves. And so on the pontoons, it's kind of different because on the inside of the pontoons, we can tell if it's leaking. And then that might spur us to another cycle. Um, but I think generally, you're right. I think in a five-year cycle, and then we do parts of the bridge each year. There was one other, and I, I didn't mark down the state, so I apologize, but the, it was one of the um, uh, hybrid, girder, hybrid girder bridges. And they appear to be boxes rather than narrow, and they appear to have access hatches. So those are hollow inside, or at least one application had that, or? Uh, no. Um, so they, they might have had, uh, initially, they might have had something there to look at it or something like that. But they, they're pretty much solid. And once they're done. Yeah, when they're done, they're filled up. More questions? Yeah, a real quick question. On the, uh, on the cracking on those pontoons, did you guys ever get to the root cause of what uh, um, there, was, there was determinations made, yeah. Care to share? <laughs> I'm not going to answer that question because there was a lot of, uh, I, I consider there's some opinions on different views on what happened there. And so, you know, I have my own opinions, but there's, there's other people that have theirs. And it gets into, you know, contracting and large dollar contracts and, all kinds of issues and problems and there, you know, the, the end result is we, we did a repair on those and then we'll have to monitor those over time. We did some other further up changes in the design to the other cycles of pontoons. So we added some more post tensioning and did some things that seemed to help. So in the other cycles of pontoons, we had um, less cracking than we did in the initial round. I know that uh, FRP and uh, some of the applications there really came into being in the mid-90s uh, with a lot of extruded shapes and uh, states using those. Did the tour at all address any of that, uh, some of those older structures and how they're performing? I think even Ohio put one in each uh, county uh, that they had. Was that uh, addressed as to the longevity of some of this, uh, particularly the solid shapes? Uh, not necessarily the, the wraps of the repairs. Yeah, there was a pretty thorough questionnaire that was put out, and so questions were asked of um, each state that wanted to participate on um, what their performance was, what their uses were. Like we, you know, we use carbon fiber strands to do seismic retrofit way back in the 90s, but there was just some reasons and, you know, cost and different things that we're, we're just pretty much doing steel. Um, for most of our seismic retrofitted columns now. But there's special applications, and that's where, where you want to look for. Uh, composites are a tool in your toolbox, and there's special applications that you may want to pull that out and use it. Um, now what's happened, you know, states have, have used, um, you know, most of their research and their opportunity to say, okay, sole source and do this here and do that. Now carbon fiber and composites have to stand on their own and, and compete and be cost effective and, you know, and make sure that they 
um, are competitive in order for them to be used more and more. Yeah, doing really good. Uh, thanks for sharing this. Wait, uh, looking forward to see the scan report. Um, two questions, and, I, and they relate to Washington, so hopefully you can answer them. Uh, one is, how did you guys overcome the, you know, the proprietary issue when you uh, were working on that bridge that you showed there last? And then the second one was, you said that you used a re uh, fiber reinforcement on a bridge, and then you've replaced that bridge since? Uh, it was or not a fiber, but it was a composite? Yeah. Is there, was there anything wrong with the composite piece of that bridge that caused it to be replaced? Uh, um, or not really. It was, it was a project in Douglas County, and it was kind of like a historic timber deck truss, so it needed something lightweight. So they put the composite on there, and it, it did pretty good for the, you know, the 10 years it was in service. Um, they actually replaced that whole bridge with a 240-foot splice girder. So they went with one, one big span and replaced this. And it was a bridge that was near a dam and it had a lot of truck traffic on it. Um, one thing that we did observe, I mean, there's a lot of different um, types of composites used in deck applications. Some of them they filled in with concrete. And I think that works better when you use the composites in conjunction with concrete. The ones where they just tried to use the composites by themselves had some issues and problems. Um, and so on the other question about the proprietary nature, there's enough uh, carbon fiber wrap companies that you don't have to go to sole source. There's enough out there where you can write your specifications around uh, on, um, different companies and, or the, the strength you want and the performance you want and then just let the uh, contractor choose the supplier. Thanks. I had a question about the Aurora Bridge and the reentrant corners on the FRP wrap. And so I guess there's always some concern about that reentrant corner, and you mentioned the steel um, angles were considered and probably FRP angles and decided on the anchors, the, the FRP anchors. Can you just, um, you know, what, what tr led you to the decision to use the anchors over the other options and, you know, was there data that, that showed the capacity of those? Yeah, that was part of the um, research we did at uh, Washington State University is we looked at all those different options and, and actually the carbon fiber um, splays performed the best. They were, they were the best performer. So, and then also, it, if you want something that kind of looks historic, then it wasn't intrusive. Um, it could kind of match the shape of the existing column. Anyone else? Well, I have a couple. <laughs> I always like to try new things, so I got Dwayne to agree that we can wrap some timber piles. So we'll be doing that this summer. And then one of them, the bridge is going to be replaced in a few years, I hope. And we'll go ahead and test it to failure, I think, on one of these, see how it works. And last week we had a, a problem with uh, kind of scouring out underneath the Heron Street Bridge with some uh, untreated timber piles exposed. And our uh, materials engineer said it wasn't a problem as far as behind it, losing material, uh, you know, fill in the hole and we're good. But our concern was we had another bridge in the same area where Unbeknownst to us, it's, it's a waterway that's very murky. You can't see what's going on. And uh, it had scoured out and getting untreated timber piles. We had very clean water. Uh, we noticed that the pier was starting to tilt. So we got divers under there and they used one of those special cameras. And we were missing 40% of our support piles. So we had to rebuild that. We put shafts in and resupported it and lifted it up. So. Bridges concern with these untreated timber piles exposed in the zone there is that the Toritos are going to get to it. And so uh, what do we do to protect those? Now we're looking at you know building a wall and pumping concrete and our, our fish and wildlife our uh, agencies there have a great deal of concern of pumping concrete in waterways and so on. So last week I had this uh, idea. I said, what if we just wrap the piles? So that's what we're going to do, and give that a try. Just wrap the piles, keep the Toritos out, and see if it'll last the 10 years before Dwayne says it may be replaced. 
But that's, you know, that's another thing that um, on the rehabilitation side, there's quite a bit of effort around the country where people have um, addressed timber pile and concrete pile deterioration using composites. We've actually done a couple where we had smaller round, like I, I think they were only a foot and a half diameter piles that were short spans in a tidal area. And so we chipped around off all the bad concrete, put in fiberglass forms, and then grouted in behind that. Um, on the timber side, I think Oregon's even tried some of that where they've done some composite wraps and then filled in some of the timber with, um, you know, epoxy or something like that. Um, so that, that's just something that we'll have to look into a little bit more when you're trying to spread your money as far as you can and seeing how we can do different preservation techniques. Great, thanks. Okay.